I'm Darius Gray. You can also get more information about today's topic and others we have covered on Questions and Ancestors on our website. Today we're talking with Scott Woodward about uh, genealogy being conducted using DNA. Um, Scott, a database of 65,000 soon to swell to over 100,000 with just one clump coming in. Mm -hmm. Hopefully a database of 500,000 ultimately. Well, actually, that's that's just our next uh, way station. We would like <laughs> the reality is we would like this to continue on until it it realistically would benefit any person on the street, essentially anywhere in the world. And I have to ask, what is the motivation? Why is it that this has been undertaken? What do you think it brings? All of us that are associated with the foundation have have one big belief that we share in common, and that is that if people understand who they are and how they are connected to each other that they're going to change the way that they behave towards each other and that the way that they change will be in a positive way we see that all of the time when you find kin you feel differently about those okay. people from that point on uh... an example from china just two days ago we were talking about this with a with a a, a, a genetic researcher from china she said we we hadn't really had a lot of information about genealogy, who we were, how we were connected, but we started to feel a little bit interested about that, and so we searched that out. Uh, and this person was actually in Taiwan, and it led them back to mainland China and the village of one of the fathers in, in the family. And when they went back, they took with them their genealogy. They had a book that contained their genealogy. They went back to the mainland, to that village. It was a very poor village. Uh, and they found in the book of genealogy in that village an exact duplicate of, of their life. They, they, they found their, their origin. Mm -hmm. When that happened, there was such a feeling about unity and coming together that the family from Taiwan donated enough money to build a new school to help with the water system and to build the infrastructure in that village in mainland China. That came from one family making a difference in a tremendous, I mean, in a whole village, because they were now connected. Those are the types of things that we like to see happening, and that's what we think that we can do with, with DNA. We can make these extended relationships and bring people together in, in ways that currently are not possible using traditional genealogical methods. Well, that's an admirable goal. We've got one more question for you. This one comes from Jim Reeves. He says, I have traced my ancestry back to about 70, 1720 in Massachusetts. I have a strong suspicion that my ancestor belongs in a certain family, but I can't find any direct information to link him into the parents or brothers and sisters. Can I do a DNA test to solve this problem? Actually, that's a perfect setup for something that, that DNA can answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we see that often. We see places where people uh, don't, do not have documented evidence that mm -hmm. would say these two individuals were brothers or uh, often the, the evidence is just missing for whatever reason it wasn't collected to start with it's been destroyed it's been lost it hasn't been found yet uh, but the thing that hasn't been lost is the genealogical record inside of your DNA and inside of that other person that you're connecting to mm -hmm. and those are questions that can be answered using DNA there are some very special um, procedures that would have to go to be done to answer specific genealogical questions, but there are very few genealogical questions that cannot be answered using DNA. Can you just take any descendant of one of those brothers or sisters of your common ancestor, um, any one of their descendants, and test them against your DNA? Technically, the answer is yes, uh -huh. um, in order, uh, and, uh, but in order to get a very definitive answer, uh, you need a group of ancestors, a, a group of descendants from that ancestor on, on both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. And that would allow you to make a very strong statement about the relationship. How accurate can those tests be? Uh, in some cases, they can approach you know, close to you know 99%, uh, which is about as good as the, so you know, anybody could get. Pretty good evidence that they're yes. related. And would that tie back right into that common ancestor? Then it would ju just tell you that there is a common ancestor somewhere between those. It, it would depend on the circumstance. A lot of cases, it would say, yes, this is the common ancestor. In other cases, it would say, yes, you do have a common ancestor, and we think that he lived in this place at this time. Okay. 
I believe uh, in some of uh, the literature that you uh, have provided us, it says that um, 30 generations back, um, we roughly all had a common ancestor. Uh, and when we get back 30 generations, uh, there weren't even a billion people on the earth. Is that correct? That's right. If you, if you do the math, it goes, uh, every, every individual has two parents. A law. I mean, there's, there's not a single person that's ever been born with less than two parents, right? At least so far. Uh, genetics, I think, is working on maybe that <laughs> I situation, hope they but don't uh, <laughs> I, I hope not. So that means you have four grandparents and you have eight great grandparents. And if you keep doing that back 30 generation, that means you have one billion potential ancestors. Okay? But potential is the critical word here. Because if you go back 30 generations, you know, that may be about 750 years ago. So 1350 AD, a billion ancestors. The problem is there were only 400 million or so people living on the earth at that time. <laughs> but if I have a billion and every one of the listeners out there have a billion, that's, uh, a lot of people. A lot of people. That means that that has to shrink down, and somehow it has to fit within the 400 million people that were living at that time, which means that it is, it, it's absolutely essential that, I mean, it's absolutely sure mm -hmm. that all of us share common ancestors. It compresses the family. Yes, absolutely. And you, you see it, you, you'll see it in your own genealogies as you go back. You will find cousins that married cousins. Uh, or, you know, the cousins that married each other. Mm -hmm. And that then essentially shrinks the no, number of ancestors from that point back. No, we don't talk about those yeah. cousins. <laughs> I think most people have in their pedigree. Oh, everyone does. I can Multiple. guarantee, I can guarantee 100% that every single person out there has has cousin marriages mm -hmm. or closer. Well, again, we'll, we'll point our, our listeners and our viewers to your website through our website, and that's going to be the uh, Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation. And the, the contributions they can make to the database will be made free of charge. And then if they seek to do something more, they can do that on their own through commercial institutions. That's correct. Thanks. All right. Well, do you have another question there that we can get in? I know our time is short. It's probably all the time we have today. All righty. So that's... Uh... That's, we've had Scott Woodward with us with, from the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation, and we've been talking about using our DNA in our genealogy research. For more information about this topic and others that we've covered, you can visit our website, www.ancestors.com. Click on Questions and Ancestors and look for the topic you're interested in. On our website, you will also find an email blank you can use to send us your family history questions or success stories, or contact us at questionsandancestors at byu.edu. I'm Darius Gray. And I'm Emily Wilbur. We invite you to tune in again next time for another edition of Questions and Ancestors.